Can I just introduce Professor Sunetra Gupta, <coughs> who's from um, Oxford University. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, she's world famous in her field and has also led lots of initiatives because of the things we've talked about, the issues, and she's sort of um, attacked those very bravely, I think. In the media as well, you've become famous, haven't you? So there is a, a brief summary of Professor Gupta's work, but maybe you could say more about yourself because it's very brief um, about the research focus. Maybe as you go along, is that all right? Yes. And there's the control of things there. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure you can, well, I hope you can all hear me. So I don't have to put anything on. Um, right, yes, I am at the University of Oxford, and um, so my own work is has mainly been, I'll say my title is Professor of, in fact, Theoretical Epidemiology, which is um, not one I chose, shall we say, but there's so many other people working on infectious diseases, it's kind of hard to find a singular title. Um, and so that's what I was granted some years ago now, almost 20 years ago. Um, so my journey into infectious diseases was actually from uh, more of a background in physics and mathematical modelling, and um, I realised that you could apply mathematics to understand biological systems, and that took me into um, the world of ecology, which is one where um, a lot of mathematical models are used to try and understand the interactions between species. And fundamentally, infectious diseases are um, a product of an interaction between two species. So a large subfield of theoretical ecology, if you like, uh, does focus on infectious disease. So the idea here being that if we understand these interactions at an individual and a population level, um, maybe we will have a better insight how to deal with these um, issues and how to um, mitigate the enormous problem that we have, the burden of infectious disease um, that we still suffer, mainly in the, also known as the global south, in other words, uh, the third world, um, uh, and, and the, here's a table showing, oh, sorry, what, this table shows you a sort of rank order of these um, diseases, sorry, this thing is sort of going to do its own thing, isn't it? Um, it's a rank order of diseases that, that kill, I mean, in terms of numbers of people killed per year, and Respiratory infections, which is a bundle of diseases, including a lot of viruses like influenza, uh, definitely not the coronavirus, not chemical, um, but other bacteria like um, the pneumococcus, so pneumococcal pneumonia, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, these constitute bulk, and of course, um, now, uh, respiratory infections, which um, tend to kill a lot of young people, diarrheal diseases, HIV AIDS, more of course a killer of um, adults. TB is still a huge killer, again, of adults. Okay. Um, malaria, meningitis, measles. Um, just been hearing is, is alarmingly on the rise because people are not vaccinating their children um, against it. Um, so we have a lot of diseases that are still a big problem. And Trying to mitigate their burden is something uh, many of us are quite still passionate about. Diarrheal diseases. <coughs> yeah, so cholera, rotavirus, there's um, typhoid. Um, so, so fundamentally, so, so that's, that's how I've um, come to work in infectious diseases. And for a long time, I was mainly interested really just in using mathematical models to try and uh, explore this relationship 
Um, but some of those models then led actually to a new idea of how we might make a flu vaccine. And so a lot of my work now actually also focuses on, um, a, a, a major focus of my work now is actually trying to make this flu vaccine. So I do have people now working in the lab and I spend a lot of my time actually um, getting my hands dirty, as they say, um, with um, actually looking at flu at a molecular level and a cellular level. So even though my title says I'm a theoretical epidemiologist, that's actually not entirely uh, a good descriptor of what I do. And the reason perhaps to belabor that is that, of course, um, a lot of my work has met with a lot of criticism lately. And one of the charges uh, directed against me is that I'm a theoretical person. Well, actually, uh, first of all, theoretical people can have a good grounding in biology anyway. And secondly, it's not actually an accurate description of um, my current practice. Anyway, so going back to this idea, the sort of ecological perspective on um, disease. Um, so we have, as I said, two species, a pathogen and what we call rather generously a host, a very unwilling host, but that's us. Right? So and the pathogen here I'm representing with this silly cartoon. The important point here is that the host is a resource for the pathogen. So without us, the pathogen uh, could not survive and it needs us and it needs us to be susceptible in order to um, be successful in its um, life cycle. So in other words, as soon, so if you have a population, if you're looking at a population of hosts of people and a bug, someone, an infected, someone gets infected by a bug, that bug can only spread to other people who are susceptible to infection. But as soon as this bug spreads, and if in this particular instance we're not um, considering that, we're considering that um, the infection is lifelong, or even if it isn't, let's say within a period of time, um, if people don't clear that bug, then what you get is a situation where people, where the bug is actually using up its resources. And by using up its resources, it actually limits itself. And this is just a fundamental concept in um, infectious disease um, epidemiology, which is that when, as soon as a disease starts to spread, it will limit itself by virtue of consuming its resources. Now, some bugs actually um, are, of course, permanent in that once you get them, some pathogens, you, you don't get rid of them. And um, chickenpox is indeed uh, such an example. We know exactly why and how. So there is no mystery there. Actually. Right. That is very clear. It lives in the dorsal root ganglia in our ner nerve cells. It just hides there, as do all other herpes viruses. So chickenpox is a member of a family of herpes viruses, which all have this ability to hide in, um, typically in, our, um, in various cells, really. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus is another example. All, obviously, the herpes viruses are a good example, um, are, are herpes viruses by definition. But those viruses are very complicated, uh, complex viruses, which have the ability to um, become latent. Uh, HIV is another example of a virus that does not you cannot get rid of, and that's because it keeps changing during the course of its, um, uh, to, to ensure in, enable chronicity. There are a number, TB doesn't, can't get rid of. So there are some viruses, which uh, some pathogens, that use this route of colonizing um, a host. And as soon as they do that, again, they sort of limit their spread. But in many other cases, the what happens is a susceptible host once colonized, actually goes on to clear the pathogen and become immune. So these are obviously silly cartoons to, to represent that process, um, but ones that I find quite useful in um, actually explaining things that are a lot more complex than, um, than just this particular sort of event of being infected and then 
clearing it. So what this sort of little cartoon is telling you is simply that you know, you're susceptible, you become infected, and then if it's measles, you recover and you have immunity. You have uh, various uh, cells in, in your body that are now primed to attack measles should, you, should it ever try and infect you again. So under those circumstances, of course, you have the, the lack of availability of the resource, the way that the resource is diminished is through immunity. It's not just infection, infection is cleared, but it leads often to a state, or sometimes at least, um, to a state of permanent immunity. And as before with the colonization um, example, you have the pathogen limiting itself through infection and by inducing immunity. And that's really what this concept of herd immunity, which has been much maligned and um, used uh, inappropriately, not just by the public or the newspapers um, or MPs like Matt Hancock, um, <coughs> but scientists have without any uh, compunction, used the word herd immunity in um, a very inappropriate way. All that herd immunity actually refers to is this fact that as soon as people in a population become immune, this poses problems for the spread of the pathogen. And the more people there are immune in a population, the harder it will find, um, um, the pathogen will find um, yeah, the harder the pathogen will um, find it to, to spread. Um, so this process whereby you have a population, nobody has any immunity, pathogen comes along, starts to spread, and then people become immune, and that then inhibits the spread of the pathogen, can be captured... Oh, so this is just a way of showing that within this particular population, as you can see, if someone gets infected and then turns up and contacts in that particular sort of neck of the woods of this population, um, that person is very unlikely to be able to spread that, path, that, that bug because everyone around them is immune. So that's just sort of, again, a cartoon illustration of what, how this all the system works. Now, that's the cartoon, but how, how do we make a different kind of cartoon, a mathematical cartoon of this system so that we can start to understand what really goes on and um, how we might be able to uh, manipulate it or think about how to utilize this um, feature that having a lot of people immune poses problems to the pathogen, how could we utilize that? So one way to get a grip, understand a system is by, through uh, mathematical models. Um, these are abstractions, they're not replicas of the systems, or they don't, they shouldn't aim to be. Um, and a very simple abstraction that um, captures the dynamics of the spread of a pathogen where you get a lifelong immunity is known as the SIR model, um, which again has been sort of thrown around in the, um, even in the media, um, so thanks to SARS-CoV-2. And in that model, what you, it's a very simple model in which you just take the population, you put them into different compartments. Are you susceptible, are you infected, or are you recovered and therefore immune to further infection? And then of course you have um, a bit of plumbing that takes you from being susceptible to being infected due to risk of infection, and you, uh, you go from being infected to, having, to being recovered um, by recovering at a particular rate of sigma. And then you can write down a set of equations from which you can derive um, this expression. Again, it's been used, um, or at least a variant of it has been used profusely in the literature, uh, in, the, in the media, which is this concept of R naught or R. Now, what R is, is simply 
the average number of new cases generated by a single person. Um, and R naught is the sort of maximum that can be, which is the same thing, the average number of secondary cases generated by a primary case in a totally susceptible population. Remember, when it's totally susceptible, that's when the pathogen has its maximum potential. So that's what R naught is. Um, and then that, then the value of R, uh, which is how many cases is this an infected person going to generate, uh, starts going down as soon as people become immune. And it turns out, if you analyze these equations, there's a threshold of the proportion of the population that needs to be uh, immune for the pathogen to no longer be able to um, maintain sustained transmission, meaning that the average number of cases goes down to below one. And that threshold is linked to R naught by a simple equation, one minus one over R naught. And so what happens when you introduce a pathogen, and here you're going to see the numbers infected and the numbers recovered or immune grow, is that you have the numbers infected growing in the red and the numbers immune growing in the blue. And as soon as the numbers immune cross the herd immunity threshold, the numbers infected start to come down again. And so in this very simple model, that's all that happens. You get this epidemic, um, the numbers immune overshoots the herd immunity threshold, and that's it. And that's, that's game over. Now, in real life, of course, well, that, that's what happens. This is the, here the time scale is only uh, a year, so you can just see that sort of little blip. But even where you have no um, loss of immunity, where immunity is permanent, so for measles, eventually pe people die. So even though you're immune and you're never going to lose it, you will die, which means that the proportion immune starts to decline because you, uh, the dead person, immune person is then replaced by a susceptible newborn. And so eventually the herd immunity threshold, the proportion immune crosses below the herd immunity threshold, and then you get another, it, infections will start creeping up again, and so you'll get a second wave. And when you get the second wave, it depends very much at the rate at which immunity, population level immunity is lost, which um, can be because of people dying or because um, immunity isn't lifelong. And it, Eventually, these systems, so you started off with absolutely nobody immune, and you went to start with, you get this first big wave, you overshoot the herd immunity threshold, start to come down again, and then you bob up and down until eventually things sort of settle around the herd immunity threshold. And that state is known as a state of endemic equilibrium, and that's where we're at with the diseases that we live with, you know, like um, indeed SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, but all the respiratory infections, even though they have a sort of seasonal pattern to them, um, effectively um, are hovering around this herd immunity threshold. And that's essentially the best you can do when it comes to sort of natural infection. Uh, that's the best you can uh, hope to achieve uh, in terms of living with a pathogen, is if you get to that point, that's where you have just a sort of stable uh, rate at which people uh, get infected uh, and the losses that you sustain are the, 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 as good as it gets when it comes to living with that pathogen, unless you can eliminate it. Of course, one of the, so, so you'd think, okay, well, we need to, unless we can eliminate a pathogen, this is where we want to head. We want to get to this point where a lot of people in the population are immune, which means we can't get that huge early surge, which is the, the, the sort of epidemic phase, as we, we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, which 
can cause many problems. So how do we, so this is then a, a desirable uh, event, if you like. You want people to, to get to this state of immunity. But the problem is that, of course, to get there through natural infection, you do have to go through that phase where you're infected. And infection may carry with it um, considerable, I mean, costs. You could get disease, could get severe disease, you could be hospitalized, you could die. So in order to avoid that, and we know that measles, for example, um, used to kill about a million children. Uh, and now that number, well, it had come down to about a quarter of a million, but as we can see, it's probably going to go up again. So something like measles does have a huge death toll. It's not just a few spots on your face and a high temperature. Um, so it's desirable that all children should avoid this middle phase of being infected. And that's why vaccination is um, such an important and useful um, thing when it comes to, to something like measles. So that the goal of vaccination is obviously to take you from being susceptible to being immune, circumventing that period of where you might get ill. And indeed, so how do we vaccinate against pathogens if, if that's something we really want to do, is take people from being susceptible to being immune? Well, traditionally, um, what people used to do is take the bug and still do it, and you attenuate it. So what you want is for, for the vaccination not to cause, I mean, the, yeah, the vaccination to not have the same virulence as natural infection. And the way you do that is you can attenuate the bug. You can actually just kill the bug. Um, or indeed, and this is where uh, my pathogen now is wearing clothes, you can just take the clothes off the bug and put it in a um, syringe, um, which gives you a sense of what those clothes actually represent, which is precisely what the immune system actually recognizes. So the immune system does not recognize the whole um, virus or the whole parasite. There are big things. The immune system is trained to recognize small parts. And so that's what this sort of um, cartoon, in this cartoon, th those clothes um, are representing. And in fact, the vaccine that the va vaccines that we developed for um, Corona SARS-CoV-2 were of that, that variety of vaccination where you just take some of the clothes off the bug and expose the immune system to those clothes. And what was done in the case of um, SARS-CoV-2 is here's the virus and um, the virus has something called the spike protein, those globules sticking out, and the spike protein is what the virus uses to attach to the host cell to get into um, our, our cells. And we make, in natural infection, we make antibodies, we make immune responses that neutralize um, that activity by binding to the protein. So the idea behind the vaccination, uh, the vaccines that were produced, was let's just take the spike protein and express it in a different, um, in a setting without all the other stuff. Uh, and one of the ways that was done was by inserting it into an adenovirus, a different viral vector. Um, and that was the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. And the other technology that was used, which was very novel, was to just take um, the genetic material that coded for the spike and package that into the uh, RNA, mRNA vaccines, which um, uh, well, this uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, I mean, there were other uh, technologies that were also used, but the, those are the ones that um, we've mainly been um, subjected to. So that's the idea behind um, the, the how you, and the sort of most vaccines that we try and make now, including the flu vaccine, 
that I'm making are based on this idea that you don't need to take the whole thing. You actually take the bits that act, do the job of eliciting the protective responses. Um, so that, that all sounds fine. So, so now what you have is, you, you know, you have a situation where you can vaccinate people and then you get herd immunity through vaccinating people uh, without suffering the consequences of natural infection. Um, and then you, uh, you know, thereby you, you actually protect the population uh, as well as the individual. And um, while theoretically, if you can, if you manage to vaccinate enough people so as to keep the proportion immune above that herd immunity threshold, you should be able to eliminate the disease. But that we've only ever been able to do that for smallpox. But with everything else, what the vaccination is really doing is keeping us at that um, level, at the endemic equilibrium level. Um, so keeping us at herd immunity um, without suffering the costs of natural infection. So that's kind of what's happening with measles and with many other um, diseases that we get, uh, routinely get uh, vaccinated children with. But that's not what happened for SARS-CoV-2. So why not? Why didn't this very simple model, this nice story I'm telling, why did that not, why did it collapse for SARS-CoV-2? Well, in order to understand that, we need to actually drill down into what the, the immune response, what these little soldiers are doing. Um, and in the case of measles, the soldiers are obviously protecting permanently against further infection. But that's not true for SARS-CoV-2, or indeed any of the coronaviruses. And this is not something we just found out the other day. We knew this. The Common Cold Unit had been studying coronaviruses. Here's a paper from, actually quite recent paper from um, in Nature Medicine, saying seasonal coronavirus protective immunity is short-lasting. With there are four other coronaviruses that are circulating, have been circulating for a while now in the human population, and they do not give you lifelong immunity. It's not, it's not like measles. SARS-CoV-2 is not like measles. So immunity against infection is transient. So yes, you can um, acquire immunity through natural infection or indeed through vaccination, but then you will lose your immunity. And this could have been uh, predicted or that, that was a, the most parsimonious conclusion to draw of vaccination, of whether vaccination would be durable um, at the point that it was rolled out. And that is indeed what I and other colleagues who bothered to read some of the old literature said. That because it is, while there are a few examples of where you, we can do better than natural immunity through vaccination, generally speaking, um, most vaccines only do as well as natural immunity. And certainly a vaccine that's been developed in nine months is unlikely to do better than natural immunity. So we knew that if there were any infection blocking effects of the vaccines, which indeed there were for a very brief period, that they would not last. And indeed, that's exactly what we saw, that um, there was very good immunity. The vaccines induced very strong antibodies neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein, um, but they waned quickly and with the waning um, went away. Um, our, our immunity against infection also went away. So what does that mean then? Does that mean we can't get to that position of herd immunity, to that herd immunity threshold with um, the, the endemic equilibrium? Uh, because with SARS-CoV-2? The answer is, it, it, it makes no difference to whether or not you can, whether you lose immunity or not, makes, does not impact on whether 
you can achieve endemic equilibrium. This system is, it, it, the transient behavior is different, but effectively in these other pathogen systems where immunity against infection is transient, you still go to exactly the same herd immunity threshold as you would for a pathogen with the same R0, but which did confer lifelong immunity. There is no difference. If you solve the equations, you get exactly the same um, herd immunity threshold. You, you have a maintenance of high levels of immunity in the population in spite of the loss of immunity at an individual level. How does that work? All it means is that it's actually, there's more of a, it's more of a, a quicker dynamic. So I often use this cistern analogy to explain how it works. So the herd immunity threshold or the equilibrium state in the cistern is determined by, um, obviously, the actual mechanism, the weight of the ball and the cock and all of that. Um, and that will be, is independent of the rate at which the water flows in and out. So measles is a system where the water flows out very slowly, the, the level, the water being the number, the proportion immune in the population. It flows out very slow, it trickles out only when people die, and it's replenished by um, children being born. The coronavirus systems, and many others like it, are ones where immunity trickles out. I mean, the water trickle, doesn't trickle out, it gushes out, but it also gushes back in. So what we have there is this continuous replenishment of herd immunity. I mean, many of you probably had, had coronavirus at least twice. Um, and that's how we keep levels high, is we keep getting it. We keep losing immunity, keep gaining immunity. Keep losing immunity, gaining immunity. So the establishment and maintenance of herd immunity through natural infection is not compromised by this, the loss of immunity at an individual level. Um, so then, so what that means is you, you cannot really maintain herd immunity through vaccination in these systems unless you vaccinate every year or maybe even every six months. So, I mean, it's just impossible to keep the system under control in the way that we can do with measles through vaccination. So what's the point then of vaccination? Why would we want a vaccine at all then? Well, the, the good news in this, these systems where you keep getting reinfected, so where herd immunity is maintained through rapid reinfection, is that reinfection itself carries a much lower risk of disease. So in effect, while you keep losing immunity against infection, reinfection um, actually kind of bypasses the state where you might get seriously ill. So in other words, although in, in, and again, this we knew, this is not something we've learned, we've had an aha moment. This is exactly what you would have predicted the vaccine to, to be doing. So while immunity against infection is transient, your first infection or vaccination can confer durable protection against severe disease. So being protected against infection is not the same thing, or rather being protected against disease is not the same thing as being protected against infection. You can become susceptible to infection again, but you may stay protected against severe disease. Indeed, a lot of our protection from severe disease um, may well arise from our exposure to other coronaviruses. So that's a much more, uh, it's a different arm of the immune system. Uh, it's a different constellation of effects that protects you from severe disease and death. And that's why vaccination has, as far as I can tell, um, been useful in, protect, in, in stopping people um, who in their, might have died from their first infection um, uh, from dying. But who were these people? Who were the people who might actually have died um, or did die from having a primary infection of COVID? 
Well, if you look at the COVID fatality rate by age, again, something we knew. This is February 11th, this is among diagnosed cases in Hubei, February 11th, 2020. So we knew already, and we'd seen the same thing in SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-1, that the death rate, the, the mortality from a virus, the infect fatality rate, was hugely um, over-dispersed, meaning that the distribution was not even across the ages. In fact, it was, there are very few people under the age of, let's say, 40, who were dying of, who have died of, of COVID-19. So we knew there was this great big skew, and it was clear that there were only certain groups of people who are vulnerable to severe disease and death. So then the issue becomes, what should we do? Well, obviously we should vaccinate those people who are clearly vulnerable. Uh, what about the rest of the population? It's obvious from what I've just said that vaccinating them will do nothing to um, the long term, the spread of the virus as such, unless you vaccinate every six months. Um, so we can't achieve herd immunity through vaccination. Um, we could protect them from severe disease, but if they're not going to get severe disease anyway, why vaccinate them? So you might say, well, you know, we don't really know. What if they get long COVID? You know, we don't know a new virus. Um, okay, so there's some possibility that they might get ill anyway. Let's let's stop them from getting getting infected, or let's give their first infection to them through vaccination. That would make sense if we were absolutely certain that the vaccine had no risk at all associated with it. That would be fine. So yeah, let's vaccinate everybody. We've got the vaccine. Okay, they might they won't die, but you know, might stop long COVID, whatever. Um, Let's do it. Um, but there was, it was a new vaccine and we, all vaccines usually have some small risk attached to them. And as it turns out, this, these vaccines did have some tangible, I think personally still small risks attached to them, but it was um, completely insane to, to have subjected people who had no risk, really, to, of dying of COVID to vaccines that at, at the time we didn't know what the risk was, and now we do have some quantification of it from studies that have been done in places like Israel, where they vaccinated everybody. Um, we do know that mRNA, the mRNA vaccines carry some, uh, a one in 10,000 risk of myocarditis. We know that the AstraZeneca vaccine can give you blood clots. Again, very small numbers of people have been affected, really, but as far as we know. Um, but it's the, the problem is that they were, they didn't need the vaccine, and that is a real problem. So, of course, we didn't, this, at the time, uh, you know, the vaccine was still in 2020, uh, when uh, sort of summer of 2020, the vaccine was still some months away. Uh, if it, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding whether we'd have a vaccine at all. Um, but also, if you'd just done your homework, you'd know that that vaccine, all that it would do, could really do, is protect those who are vulnerable. So, um, in October 2020, when people were thinking of locking down again. So yes, so what's the solution then? So the solution that was being touted at the time was to lock down to try and stop the spread of the virus. Um, so you could argue, okay, well, look, we don't have the vaccine yet. We know it can protect elderly people, or vulnerable people. Um, why not just stop the spread of the virus until we have the vaccine? Um, the reason not to do that is because lockdowns are incredibly, incredibly costly. Lockdowns caused enormous harm, had already 
demonstrably caused a lot of harm, particularly in the global south. So there were a group of us who were thinking at the time, basically, that we cannot afford lockdowns. It was already, again, completely clear. Um, and just to go back, so from that point of view that we could not afford lockdowns and that the fatality rate by age had this skew, we came up, and now by we, I don't just mean the Great Barrington Declaration, I'm very proud to have been one of the founders of it, but, you know, Martin and Jay and I got together, well, we had a meeting um, in a place called Great Barrington in um, early October, and we wrote this and we just put it out there. Um, but of course, there were many other people. Uh, and just the week before that, uh, we'd written an open letter in the UK um, um, with with other people like Carl Hennigan, Carol Sikora. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of people involved. We weren't the only ones. But and this is something we just did because you know you think we've got to do something. Well, let's do this and see what happens. Um, but of course, it's. Um, I guess it was worth doing because now it's there and people can look at it and, and it becomes part of of the history. Um, although, of course, it attracted a lot of uh, negative uh, views as well. So the idea with the Great Barrington Declaration was ridiculously simple and basically what had been proposed previously by all most people thinking what to do in these sorts of circumstances, which is to shelter the vulnerable but allow immunity to accumulate in the population, natural immunity. And obviously, we were um, we didn't want to uh, give the impression that we weren't interested in investments in therapy and vaccination to protect those who are vulnerable. And we were exercised by the sort of nationalism that was growing around kind of trying to keep the virus out. And so we wanted to think outside national boundaries. So that's basically what the Great Barrington Declaration of all it said. Let's go back to the way we did things before. Let's not try and lock uh, the populations down because we don't know whether that's going to work. And even if it does, we simply cannot afford them. We, um, the, these are um, from uh, media articles at the time. So that's 21st of April, 2020. So COVID-19 will double the number of people facing food crises unless swift action is taken. COVID-19, they're substituting for lockdowns. And then again, COVID set to cause, no, lockdown set to cause a surge, uh, 400,000 surge in TB deaths because people were simply not receiving their medication for TB. People were not being vaccinated. Um, children who should have been vaccinated against measles were not were later vaccinated, um, not vaccinated against measles, partly because there was this drive to vaccinate kids against COVID. And the other problem is that big people started to, when they started to see the, what the, the problems the vaccines caused, um, became vaccine hesitant across the board, which of course affects other, these more important of the means that the vaccines the kids really need don't get delivered to them. Again, we warned about this at the time. So we can't afford lockdowns. So, um, that was the fundamental premise of it. And we, interestingly, when we said this, people challenged us. They said, well, how do you know? I have a message from a former graduate student of mine who's doing extremely well um, in the world, world saying, um, Oh, Shunetra, you're going to, the onus is going to have, is on you to prove that lockdowns actually have um, caused harm. So, in December uh, 2000, we set up a charity, and this is, sort of, it's early, sort of, a, 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 a screenshot of its original early website, um, called Collateral Global. Uh, which we thought of as a global repository for research into the collateral effects of COVID lockdown measures. And um, we're still going, and I'll, I'm going to come back to what we're doing now at the end of this talk. Um, but first, let me just quickly run you through what happened when we put the Great Barrington Declaration out and started 
talking about the harms of lockdown and suggesting Essentially, the entire scientific community came down on us at Tom Bricks. Very shortly afterwards, there was a rejoinder. I mean, it's as if we were throwing down the gauntlet. We were simply saying, let's have a discussion. We can't afford lockdowns. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's think of other ways. I mean, uh, let's get experts from various different areas together to come up with a better plan. Instead, a bunch of people, they're not, not all of them are scientists, wrote something called the John Snow Memorandum, where they took the name of um, the father of epidemiology, John Snow, um, in vain. In, John Snow was an epidemiologist who uh, identified a, a pump in Soho as being the source of cholera and uh, asked for the removal of the pump handle um, in the mid-19th century. Um, so they had no hesitation taken. I think he'd be turning in his grave if he read the John Snow memorandum, because essentially it makes three assertions, two of which are patently ridiculous. First of all, they said in October 2020, they, they said, first problem apparently was, what if there is no naturally acquired immunity to sars cov I mean, by then there'd been numerous studies showing that there was naturally acquired immunity to sars cov 2 and because it is only another coronavirus, it would make no sense even in January to think that there will be no naturally acquired immunity. They asked, what if immunity does not last forever? Which again, we knew it doesn't last forever. But, um, the problem is they misinterpreted it as I'll show you. And then the third question, which is actually a valid question, is how do you shelter the vulnerable? We'll come to that in a minute. So what if there's no naturally acquired immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is, is an absurd comment to make. What if immunity doesn't last forever? Well, I've just shown you that it doesn't make any difference to the build-up of herd immunity or, or whether you can achieve endemic equilibrium. Um, it doesn't make any difference that immunity is not lifelong. Indeed, as I said, we knew immunity against infection was transient, and yet we had um, all sorts of articles in uh, media and uh, academic journals like Nature talking about the false promise of herd immunity. And for some reason, they linked this to Donald Trump's administration. The proposals embraced by Donald Trump's administration could bring, bring untold death and suffering because it's apparently herd immunity is a false Promise. No, it's not. It's what these systems do. It's what it's done, in fact. And, um, you know, there were academics, I don't know who Rivers is, but um, she said, um, if people who are infected become susceptible again in a year, then basically you'll never reach herd immunity through natural transmission. That is a quote. It appeared in Nature um, in 2020, uh, towards the end of the year, after we Publish the Great Barrington Declaration. So, sorry, that. But as I said, we know that that is uh, not true. I've shown you why. And indeed, once you add some seasonality into the mix, into these models, you can, in fact, reproduce the patterns of SARS CoV 2, the dynamics that we've seen pretty much everywhere. So, as if you've got short-term infection blocking immunity and um, some seasonality in um, the transmission of the virus. What basically happens is that herd immunity threshold now is no longer a flat line across the year. It goes up and down. And that means that sometimes we find ourselves above it as a population. Sometimes we find ourselves below and therefore you get epidemics at particular times of the year. But suffice it to say that that would, would fully explain the patterns we've seen everywhere. Um, at the time, of course, we had, didn't have all this data. Um, we were sitting very much at the, uh, on the edge of what would be, in many places, a second wave. Um, but what happened is that a sort of convulsion in... Oh, so this is showing you how the time of entry, when the virus first comes into the population, 
has a huge impact on the particular shape. And that's why in New York, you had this big first wave because it arrived at a time when the herd immunity threshold was high, uh, as in, in the winter, whereas somewhere like um, Arizona, it came in the summer, so you actually just had a very small first wave and then a much bigger wave in the winter. And following um, at, the, at this point where we didn't really know what the debate, I suppose, central debate there was basically what is, we had had some waves which had resolved, but had they resolved due to lockdowns or was it due to basic sort of um, processes involving herd immunity and seasonality? What erupted, though, was uh, a state which I only captured as well as Stevens could, um, where he says, we live in an intricacy of new and local mythologies, political, economic, poetic, which are asserted with ever enlarging incoherence. And so a set of myths started to circulate. The first myth of which was that herd immunity had played no role at all in these dynamics that we'd have observed that far. And this was despite the fact that we could see that not only did we have immunity to SARS-CoV-2 already uh, in many parts of the world, but also that our exposure to the other coronaviruses, those seasonal cold viruses, also might well have played a role in stopping that first wave. Um, the second myth was that we can keep it out and suppress it um, by a range of methods which, as I said, increased and in, enlarged in incoherence um, and was bolstered by um, computer simulations which effectively basically encoded the idea that these things like standing two meters apart or whatever would stop transmission and then uh, played that out within a uh, sort of spatial framework. And, you know, you talked about ma mathematical modeling supporting something. Mathematical models don't do that. What they do is they generate testable hypotheses, which you go out there and test. But if you throw in, if you make a sort of simulation where you decide that staying two meters apart, you put in a function that says, well, infectivity declines by distance in this way. Uh, and then you just run the model, you will get exactly what you put into it, which is that, oh, staying two meters apart will stop spread. And again, you have scientists, and I have no hesitation in <laughs> not making this anonymous, um, writing um, sort of uh, social media, in the social media, writing things like this. I don't have hard evidence, but I worry a bit about shared playground experiment. Playing ball in the park should be fine, as long as the ball plays in the same bubble, or you're kicking it, or the kids are old enough not to lick the ball. I mean, this is the level of <laughs> discussion, the ever enlarging incoherence, which arose from, you know, starting with certain things that were not so um, unreasonable, like if you're vulnerable, stay at home. Um, certainly you can reduce your individual risk by staying at home. That's the whole basis of the Great Barrington Declaration. The problem is, can you extrapolate from that to, to the population? Can staying at home, stay at home orders be applied across the population? The answer is no. And if it's not applied, um, I mean, if you can't apply it across the population and do go halfway house, what does it do? Well, the answer, it doesn't half stop the epidemic. It doesn't do anything at all. We've seen that now. At the time, you could argue that we didn't really know. But the point is that it descended into this kind of nonsense. And the third myth, of course, was this, that we're all going to die or at least get long COVID. And um, this, again, was obviously not true, but clearly there was just this enormous inflation of the actual risk. And then, of course, came the variants, which again put people in a complete tizzy. And it was 
you know, every time a new variant would arrive, there'd be this panic. Oh my God, who knows what this is going to do? It could be a lot more transmissible. It could be more virulent. And everyone was in a panic. Um, and professed certainty, which is the real problem we talked about, about this. When in fact, if you write down, if you take that SI out and simple model, and you put in more variants and things which you can do, and which is really what I've spent most of my adult life doing, you can say from a very simple exercise that it's actually impossible to say whether a new virulent is intrinsic, uh, variant is intrinsically less virulent or more virulent or more transmissible. You just don't know because um, certainly if something is more transmissible, it has an advantage of what's already there, and they're all competing for resources, remember. But if it also has the capacity to evade immunity, which many of these variants did, the new variants did, because they were trying to um, escape from population level immunity already established by the previous strain, then such a variant can actually spread through the population, even if it is less transmissible, because it has this huge advantage that it can infect people who have already been infected. So what we saw played out um, in the early days of one variant coming after the other was, again, completely, you know, it wasn't out of um, the ordinary. It's, I don't think there was any particular difference between any of the variants and their transmissibility or virulence. And then when Omicron came along, there was this other myth that, oh, look, it's become a virulence, but it's diminished in virulence. Um, so everything's okay now because it's diminished in virulence. It's become more transmissible, so we can't contain it anymore through lockdowns, but it's become less virulent. And this is the myth that unfortunately prevails um, and uh, is what people relied on to release lockdown, the government relied on to release lockdown. Um, actually, Omicron, the studies now indicate Omicron, um, it was, is equally virulent. The reason we stopped dying from it is because we had all already, or meant most of us, either been infected or been vaccinated. So it was landing in a population that was largely uh, immune to severe disease, not immune to infection, but immune to severe disease. Um, but anyway, the, the variants clearly created well, another sort of added sort of fodder for panic. Um, so, so, so ideas surrounding immunity, acquired immunity, and the intrinsic properties of the new variants led to this kind of mess in people's heads about what was going on. Um, but a lot of it was unnecessary because we had enough direction from viruses that we'd studied before um, about how things were likely to pan out. But the, that final thing that this John Snow memorandum said, how can you possibly shelter the vulnerable, is of course an, an important question that needed to be answered. And um, in the Great Barrington Declaration, we did actually provide a few tips, but you know these are things that need to be discussed by experts in those particular fields. But either way, the fact is that we know that if you do stay at home, if you isolate yourself, you can protect yourself. That is true. And if that's not true, then you can, certainly can't lock down. Um, so there was no reason for them to come down so hard on the idea that you couldn't isolate vulnerable people. This is predicated on the, the notion that even if you isolate, you could not isolate vulnerable people if uh, infection levels were too high. But the problem is that if you think that you can, um, that, that lockdowns will keep infection levels down, then effectively, if, if they don't work and you don't isolate the vulnerable, then that is closer to a let it rip strategy than isolating the vulnerable and letting uh, the infection work its way through the rest of the population. And that's kind of what I was trying to oops, do in this diagram, but 
I think, in the interests of tolerance. Just carry on. So fundamentally, what we did during the epidemic was what I call an inversion of the schedule of certainties. What we were least certain about was the effects of NPIs on transmission dynamics, NPIs being non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, on the transmission dynamics of the pathogen and indeed the long-term goal. So let's say you manage to suppress it for a while, uh, then what? If you release it, you'll get the, the same problem unless you have a vaccine um, to protect the other. Uh, the thing that we were most certain about was that these non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdowns, would cause extreme and long-term damage to the most vulnerable in the vulnerable to lockdowns, the young, the old, the poor. And we had some uncertainty, obviously, about regarding the fundamental biolog biological properties of the virus, but far less so than what was broad broadcast. And Wesley Park, uh, oh, sorry, this is from a talk I gave after a dinner at the Institute, um, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, and Wesley was there, but it, so this is a leftover from that. But um, he made this very um, perspicacious comment that this uncertainty was actually weaponized. So you can, you can weaponize certainty, you can also weaponize uncertainty, and that's what happened. So fundamentally, where are we left now? I think, um, obviously, now we have a lot more certainty regarding the fundamental biological properties. Um, we have a lot more certainty about all of these things. And um, it's clear that the NPIs didn't have too much of an effect on the spread, um, that they have caused a lot of harm. Uh, that's something that people are finding hard to deny. Um, uh, but nonetheless, um, it's clear, and um, for example, the COVID inquiry, the module that uh, uh, was conducted just before Christmas, um, did not even touch, uh, except in very light terms, um, on the effects of lockdowns, the long-term damage, the extreme and long-term damage, uh, which leaves us very concerned about what will happen if we have another event like this. And to that end, we um, are continuing with this enterprise Collateral Global, which is now a charity. And our director, Kevin, is here, in case you want to chat to him. So this is the new look of the website. Just got a lot, got a lot of you. <laughs> but Kevin has done a, a fantastic in-depth study of these harms, which it's going to provide a springboard for us to try and look at them at a more uh, focused country level. At the same time, we try and encourage activities like we've made some films in the Global South to just open people's eyes about what happened to children in India, what daily life in post-pandemic Senegal is like now, what happened to the sex workers in Mumbai. Um, so we've made, we made, we've made films, we've made some explainers, um, we also, um, well, we're trying to make, well, this, this, in this thing, you can see that my COVID inquiry witness statement has been published on here because that I was asked for witness statement, but then not allowed to defend any of it during this module. But we engage in a set of activities which we hope will, the next time, remind us, keep, be a roadblock to the implementation of policies uh, which we think were very damaging and did not uh, do much to stop the spread of the disease. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you.